Good afternoon and welcome. Nice to see you all online. My name is Etienne Basso and I am director at the Members Research Service at TPRS and I'm standing for Anthony Teasdale, uh, director general who had a last minute commitment. And I'm happy to introduce this event together today with uh, Ronald De Bruyne, who is the director of COST. I would like to welcome our guest speakers uh, from Europe and America, as well as our online audience today. And that's actually a result of this COVID crisis that we are organizing these uh, online events in the EPRS. And maybe a good thing after all uh, the many negative things that were coming out of this crisis that we are reaching out uh, through the continents. Um, this is the first event we organized together with the European Cooperation in Science and Technology COST. And we organized this event on an extremely topical subject, which is the future of pandemics preparing for health shocks in the 21st century. And the advent of COVID-19 pandemic has made us more aware of how imminent threats can rapidly disrupt our social fabric and of the importance of coordinating EU level cooperation frameworks for preparedness and response to public health crises, as well as for concrete policy initiatives of various kinds. So this event will take a close look at potential present and future health threats, discuss what we have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and assess how we can apply that learning in our preparedness for future crises. For the EPRS, it's a part of a wider work on what we call future shocks, a publication we'll share uh, online, which is about identifying uh, about 15 possible shocks that could hit our societies and trying to define responses uh, that we could uh, put together. So it is called uh, Future Shocks Monitoring Risk and Capabilities for Europe in a Contested World. And I encourage you to read this. And especially the chapters on um, the risk of a new pandemic, but also the reflection of what could become uh, a solution, namely a closer union on health. I would like also to welcome and to introduce uh, Mrs. Uh, Van Bremt, who is member of the European Parliament, and she's chair of the Parliament's special committee to investigate the EU's response to the pandemic and learn lessons for the future, it's called COVID, as well as being member of the Committee on International Trade. Mrs. Van Bren has been a member of the Parliament since 2009. She's uh, from Belgium and she's a member of the group uh, S&D in the European Parliament. Previously, she served as a State Secretary for Labour Organization and Welfare at work in the Belgian federal government and as a Minister for Mobility, Social Economy and Equal Opportunity in the Flemish Regional Government. And she holds a BA in Sociology from the KU in Leuven. Before giving her the word, I would like to uh, ask uh, Mr. De Bruyne to say a few words of introduction for this event. Over to you. Thank you so much. And indeed, since 1971, COST, which stands for European Cooperation in Science and Technology, is offering networking opportunities for researchers and innovators across Europe and beyond, because our intergovernmental framework includes 40 member countries, and we are receiving our funding out of the Horizon Europe Framework Programme. Our core instruments uh, are the cost actions, which are bottom-up, uh, interdisciplinary networks uh, that offer a fertile, let's say, breeding ground for the development of much needed ideas and solutions. It's not only for the current, but also for future developments, including, of course, also health threats. We support around 250 cost actions, of which many are dealing directly or indirectly with aspects linked to this health crisis. In 2020, an initiative was launched by one of the actions that has led to a network of actions against COVID-19, which is now comprising 77 of our cost networks. We feel that this is an excellent example of how a common topic can actually become the booster of promoting collaboration and cooperation you know, amongst cost networks from different disciplines and research fields. 
Uh, this network, uh, this larger network, is composed altogether of more than 8,000 researchers. And I just would like to point out that they have done a magnificent job in making a publication. I hope it is visible uh, for the viewers uh, today. And I'm sure that there will be an electronic copy made available through the chat via link uh, to have a look at a truly multidisciplinary let's say, assessment of the pandemic and how to deal with future pandemics, which is, of course, the topic of today. Uh, we have two speakers at this event who are involved in uh, these actions that are part of the network, uh, Jeremy Webb and Nicholas Collin. And of course, our president, Alain Beretz, will offer you his reflections at closure. Now, clearly, cost, uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, has shown the value of science-informed policy advice. And that is the contribution that we are trying to make. And of course, it's all about the complexity uh, uh, involved and the requirement, of course, also for some out of the box thinking, which transcends scientific disciplines, actors and regions. So we at COST put great emphasis at this. We are here to nourish and train also our COST action participants to engage with policymakers to create a maximum impact in the long term. And to that end, we are providing uh, training under the umbrella of our COST Academy. Uh, on how to write policy briefs, for example, and how to engage with policymakers. So this is, of course, very much aligned with the mission also of the European Parliament's Research Service, making both organizations yeah, an impactful force, we hope, in these kind of debates. So I'm very pleased um, to, uh, of course, welcome you all uh, to this important event. I think it's really uh, on topic, on time. And let me therefore retain by expressing my gratitude to the EPRS for providing us the opportunity to contribute uh, to this debate. And I retain by wishing you all a very fruitful and inspirational workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ronald, for these uh, introductory work, uh, words. Uh, over to you, uh, Mrs. Van Brent. Hello to you all. Um, I think we mutually tried to unmute, um, so I keep away from the bottom. Uh, um, so uh, happy to see all of you. Let me first thank the EPRS for organizing um, this important round table. Uh, um, indeed, if you look to the uh, key question of this event, how do we prepare for future um, health shocks and what have we learned uh, from the pandemic? That is also a key question in the COVID committee, where I have the honor, uh, where I have the honor to chair that very important uh, special committee within the Parliament. Um, when I look at the speakers today, I see many people of a biomedical uh, background, and of course, um, uh, for sure, medical science is key when you want to tackle um, a pandemic and when you want to prepare for the future health shocks. But if there's one lesson that I already learned before the COVID committee um, uh, starts working, that is that a pandemic um, uh, cannot be solved solely by looking at the medical aspects. Um, you absolutely need to break the silos um, within our society on these issues. Let me give you an example. Um, if you develop a good vaccine, and we have developed the best vaccine in the world during the pandemic, but the global supply chains breaks down, you will have huge difficulties in producing these vaccines for your population. And that is what exactly happened um, at the end of 2020. We had the science, we had the vaccine, it was authorized, but we were not able to produce it at large scale for the uh, European and the worldwide population. So the, the EU has worked really very fast on market authorization on the one hand and on a very well fast common purchase agreement, but had not taken care of what we could call the manufacturing capacity within Europe and the necessary supply chains. And the result was that at the beginning of 2021, we did not have the necessary vaccines uh, that people were looking for. This is only just one example. Um, there are numerous others, such as the link between inequality and vaccine hesitancy, for instance, or the link between investment in public health 
and avoiding lockdowns during a pandemic. The point is that the only way to prepare for future shocks is to look at the problems and solutions from an interdisciplinary view. Our collective goal should be um, uh, the next crisis. Um, uh, the next crisis, the EU should not be one, but they should be two steps ahead. And we will not hopefully waste another time, months before um, we are prepared, or bad coordination between uh, states. Uh, um, uh, we make sure that our supply chains are monitored from the very first day and that our chief scientists experts that they make European wide recommendation on how to manage the crisis and not just based on the member states. That is why the European Parliament has set up this COVID committee to look in depth and not in silos at the very general point where did the pandemic and the COVID crisis hit in our societies. And that is also why we have four different pillars within the COVID committee, health, which is obvious, of course, but also the social economic impact, democracy and fundamental rights. And I have to say very important, uh, Europe is not, it was not a crisis, health crisis in Europe. It's been a worldwide crisis. And I think we also learned if we do not tackle it worldwide, then the pandemic will last much, much longer. We will have a lot of mutations and these mutations will hit back um, in different societies as they did also in European society. And that's why it also the global, global view of what happened during that pandemic, lessons learned there is so very much important. So four pillars, and we will not try to work in four silos, but look at these four pillars in an interdisciplinary and very connected uh, way. So yes, I am very grateful um, that the IPRS is organizing this event today um, because it is so incredibly important that we have the debate right now. And why is that? Because this is the perfect moment to learn. We have both the advantage of taking a distance and real distance from what happened, but also still have the experience uh, of today to make the right analysis of this pandemic. Um, uh, it is very important that we made that we have that distance from the acute phase in the pandemic, because in that acute phase of the pandemic, we need to take very fast decisions. And in a democracy, that's not the right moment to make an analysis. But at the same time, the experts that took or prepared a lot of these decisions, um, but also the politicians that were in place at the, at the moment at European level, but also at the member state level, are still there, the European Commission, for instance, um, so that we still have the expertise at hand. And that's why this is now the time to make the analysis. Um, and that is also the timetable of the COVID committee in the European Parliament. We have a year, most probably we will ask for an extension, but no longer than six months, because I absolutely want us to work thorough, but also fast and have our recommendations for the future. And so making Europe much more prepared for future health shocks, but also other crises um, uh, before the end of this term, so that the next Commission, the next European Parliament, and the Member States can take these recommendations on board. Unfortunately, I have to say, um, I have another meeting. It's also COVID related, um, I'm preparing with the coordinators, the, 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 the working method, and all the different hearings in the committee. Um, but my assistants will uh, stay around, um, uh, listen to all the excellent experts and the conclusions, and um, give feedback to me. All the success in this, uh, in this uh, round table. And hope to see you, uh, all of you, at a certain moment in time in the COBI committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Van Bren. Thank you for being with us, for sharing your thoughts and for highlighting how important it is that Parliament uh, uh, embrace this issue and how important it is that we have a public debate on this is also about democracy and in time of crisis, it's important to, to keep high the, 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 the role of democracy. Uh, many thanks to you and all the best for this uh, COVID committee uh, uh, work. Thank you so much. I would like uh, now to hand over the uh, moderation of this event to Gianluca. Gianluca Quaglio has been actually for quite a long while a member of our teams in the EPRS where he was analyzing um, 
uh, health issues and uh, health policies. And now he has moved within the house to uh, now reinforce medical service within our DG uh, Director General for, for Personnel. So he's one of the few uh, that is both a doctor and a specialist of EU policies. And uh, we are very happy to have you, uh, Gianluca, to moderate uh, this discussion uh, later this afternoon. Over to you, Gianluca. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, thank you, Director. Thank you, Etienne, for inviting me to, to be here today as a, as a moderator of this important event. Uh, let me remind you that uh, I work uh, at present in the Medical Preparedness and Crisis Management Unit, which is a new unit embedded into the medical service. Uh, the meeting of today discuss possible future pandemics from different perspectives, and we have a, a, an eminent group of speakers with different backgrounds. Uh, the webinar is organized in three sections. Each section has two speakers. You can send questions at any time. The questions will be conveyed to the speakers in the second part of the event at the end of the six uh, presentation. I think that we can start with the first session. The first session is entitled Emerging Health Threats. The section addresses two, uh, two points, the concept of circular health and the problem of antimicrobial resistance. The first speaker is Ilaria Capua, uh, professor and director of One Health Center of Excellence at the University of Florida in the US. Uh, she has also an important uh, experience as a policymaker. Uh, she served as a member of the Italian Parliament in the period 2013-2016. She graduated in veterinary medicine from the University of Perugia in Italy and holds a PhD on avian influenza epidemiology from the University of Padova in Italy. Uh, good afternoon, Ilaria. Uh, the pandemic sent an important message to everyone uh, that we needed to rethink health at all levels, at surveillance level, at the clinical level, in the management of health system. We are interested to know how the concept of circular health can support in rethinking health. Please, Ilaria. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gianluca, and thank you to the other participants. I am, of course, a European scientist who has benefited so much from the cost actions and from all the work that has been done in Europe to create networks of scientists um, that would eventually create a fantastic critical mass of very diverse people. So. Although I am currently in the States, I am very, very glad to be here. It's a little bit like coming home. Um, and there are several people, Nicola and Andrea, from my previous slides, so thank you. Um, before I put up my slides, I would like to um, touch a few of the things that have been said. Uh, namely, uh, Etienne Basso started saying um, that pandemics are transformational events, and this is, um, probably the main message of, of my talk. Pandemics transform and they transform our lives, they transform our way of seeing things, and they transform our way of working. And this is exactly what Etienne Basso mentioned at the start. Um, we also know that pandemics are shocks, especially for people who don't expect pandemics. Um, I think that now the world population um, sees things in a different way. I have spoken to empty rooms with three people in the room um, about the risk of pandemics. And um, I think that now we have a completely different situation because people, citizens, the people who are listening to us today, understand the importance of uh, um, getting around certain mechanisms that govern our health. And with this, I would like to um, start sharing my slides. And uh, I would like to start with um, this slide, which um, um, it's good. Uh, can you can you see it? Yes, you can see it, but you want to see it in presentation mode. Can you expand mode. it, please? 
Yes, there. So this is my first slide. I think that one of the things that the citizens out there have absolutely figured out is that finally, after, I mean, so many years that veterinarians and medic and public health people have been working on the One Health concept, that we are part of a system and that our health is interconnected and interdependent to that of other living creatures that are on the planet that go from microscopic creatures like viruses to macroscopic creatures like elephants and whales and, and uh, ocean health. Um, I think that European citizens now understand that certain things um, that were done in a certain way cannot be done in that way anymore. We need to be more respectful of the environment and we need to understand what each one of us can do to look at health in a more integrated way. And um, this brings me to my next slide, which I would, with this slide, I would like to show you the evolution of the concept of One Health. And starting from the circle, which was uh, on the right in the previous slide, we see that there's this motif of circularity uh, around health, which is, emerges uh, over the years um, as people analyze it. So One Health was, of course, has a long story. It starts many, many, many years ago in the 18th century, but then it's sort of the idea that human health, animal health, and environmental health are, co are connected, and they have a central area which is the One Health Zone, started um, in the 60s and in the uh, 80s, and then around the turn of the century with avian influenza and BSE and a series of other pathogens, it became something uh, which was a bit bigger than this. And this picture here is a picture which I stole from The Lancet, which shows you how this little triangle here in the middle, One Health, has been expanded to um, include a series of other aspects, which of course, as uh, Mrs. Uh, Van Brandt was saying, include so uh, social sciences and include, include policy legislation and governments and include a series of other drivers that the original One Health concept did not include. And so then what I did was I went to steal another picture from somebody else. Most, I'm sure that a lot of you know about the Netherlands Center of One Health. This is a picture that was developed in, in 2022. And you will see that the core of One Health is here and is still the central pillar of how we need to manage our health issues. But there is much more than only human, animal, and environmental health and how they overlap. There is mobility and transport. There's population growth. There are conflicts. There are refugees. There is international trades. There, there are many, many other factors that can govern health and that can take us somewhere else. And this brings me to my last slide, which is um, looking at how uh, a, a concept of circular health, which is based on the fact that we operate and we live in a closed system. Okay, so we have realized with many of the issues that we are facing, the pandemic is one of them. But for example, antimicrobial resistance, which is a very big problem, and we know that this problem is going to hit us, is something that does not affect only humans. It affects humans, it affects animals. It is used also, antibiotics are also used in agriculture. And so we need really to find ways to join forces. And starting from this example and looking at the only roadmap that is um, agreed by, by many, many of the UN member states, which are the Sustainable Development Goals, um, I believe that the Sustainable Development Goals should act as a backbone to address these issues in a circular way. So, for example, going back to antimicrobial resistance, we can, of course, address it in many ways, but 
There are several of these goals, for example, apart from good health and well-being, but we have quality education. We need to educate people not to throw antibiotics in the trash. We need to educate people that vaccines prevent and antibiotics cure, and often there is an abuse of antibiotics. This brings at me to a series of other considerations. Gender equality, there is a gender component to antimicrobial resistance for a series of reasons that I will not go into. We know that clean water and sanitation is something extremely important. And if we look at all the sustainable goals, we will see that many of them, including life underwater, life on land, um, innovation and uh, infrastructure, they can all contribute to resolving this problem. And with this, I would like to close my intervention by saying that we need to look at things in a different way. We need to um, understand, we need to understand that um, we need to work in an interdisciplinary way, and we need to find the new interconnections that drive health. Apart from the human, animal, and environmental interface, which is the beating heart, it is actually, uh, there are other drivers which are incredibly important. For example, social media, for example, communication, for example, education that can make the real difference um, to improving the health of humans, animals, plants, and the environment as one system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia, for this uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, the concept of the circular health clearly imply, as you said, a, a high level of interdisciplinarity and uh, a sort of holistic approach. I hope that uh, as a community, researchers, policymakers, we are able and uh, capable to, to start at this challenging process. Uh, we have the opportunity to discuss again uh, during the question and answer session this, this important concept. Thank you again, Nadia. The, the second speaker of this section is Jeremy Webb, Professor of Microbiology at the University of Southampton. He is also co-director for the UK National Biofilms Innovation Centre, an interdisciplinary centre that provides a platform for academia and business. Uh, as mentioned, antimicrobial resistance is, is also called a silent pandemic is a growing problem uh, that needs an urgent attention at all levels. Please, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you, John Luca, and, and also to the European Parliamentary Research Service and to COST uh, for this invitation. It's an honour to speak to you all today. Um, antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, is one of the major public health threats uh, for this century. As COVID continues, we need to remember that other threats haven't gone away and that AMR remains a huge international challenge. It's often described as a, a hidden pandemic in the shadows. It's perhaps less visible, but instead is seen as extended hospital stays, prolonged bacterial infections and many otherwise uh, preventable deaths. So it's here, it's taking lives and it's costing many billions, and it leads to the spread of bacteria that cannot be killed or controlled with existing medicines. And the emergence and evolution of new drug resistant bacteria, uh, our overuse of antibiotics, our failure to, de to develop new methods for tackling infection could leave us without viable treatments for even uh, the most trivial infections within the next few decades. So there's been a number of high profile reports. Uh, for example, the O'Neill report commissioned by the uh, UK Prime Minister, then David Cameron, predicted more than 10 million deaths globally, annually by 2050. And that would exceed the current global deaths related to cancer. 
The World Health Organization places AMR as one of the top global public health challenges for the next decade. And the United Nations identifies it as one of the greatest threats that we face as a global community. When I started by saying this has been a hidden pandemic, the picture on the global disease burden is becoming clearer. So just this, just this year, the Lancet has published a comprehensive global survey of the disease burden of AMR. There were 1.3 million global annual deaths directly attributable to AMR um, in 2019. So this is much higher than previous estimates. And, and to give an idea of the scale, this is the same as global HIV and malaria deaths combined and may indicate that global estimates for deaths in the coming decades may need to be revised uh, substantially upwards. There's also a huge global burden of chronic or long-term infections that don't respond to antibiotics. Uh, associated with medical surfaces and devices, I'm talking about prosthetic valves, catheters, implants, and I include non-healing wounds in this category too. These also create a huge impact, costing many tens of billions and many lives. Uh, so these kinds of chronic infections are what we call biofilms, where bacteria come together and they produce a, a sort of protective glue so that antibiotics and immune responses literally cannot penetrate the physical structure of the biofilm. So you end up with a protected reservoir of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. These chronic, chronic biofilm infections are a key pathway for AMR. And that's what we work to address at the National Biofilms Innovation Centre here in the UK. Uh, addressing biofilms requires a highly interdisciplinary approaches uh, because we need to understand both the physical structure, the chemistry and the biology of these systems to develop innovative strategies. And this includes work on novel antibiotic free approaches uh, capable of disrupting biofilms to prevent AMR. And we thank COST for their support on aspects of this research. So the causes of AMR and its spread are of course complex. And this includes the overuse and misuse of anti antibiotics in medical, veterinary and agricultural settings. Uh, and a contributing factor here is the lack of rapid diagnostic and analytical technologies so that we can use the right antibiotic only when it's needed. The causes also include spread of antibiotics and antibiotic resistant bacteria in, their envir in the environment, as was mentioned, through sewage, manure and pharmaceutical manufacturing waste. But perhaps the most important challenge is an economic one. There are disincent disincentives that have led to a stalled pipeline of novel antibiotics to replace or supplement the loss of existing drugs. The issue of market access to drive commercial development for novel antimicrobials is, is key. So normally when you're developing a new drug, you'd want to get it onto the market and sell it as widely as possible. But for new antibiotics, almost the reverse is true. When new antibiotics are held back to treat only those patients that, that, that really need them. An updated analysis of the clinical pipeline is that there are only 76 antibacterial agents currently in clinical development, of which only four of these have new modes of action compared with marketed drugs. So these numbers pale in comparison with the more than 1300 treatments under clinical development to tackle cancer, for example which may be seen as more lucrative medications that attracts uh, private investment. So new models and reimbursement mechanisms need to be conceived and trialed to incentivize new antimicrobial R&D. And as one example of such an, approach, uh, such an approach, AMR is embedded within the UK government and NHS strategy. 
Uh, and in 2019, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, and NHS England announced that they will trial a subscription model when paying for new classes of antibiotics. So this year, in fact, the NHS will begin the first of these where companies will be paid a fixed fee uh, for new antibiotics. I, I think I've seen that it's set at 10 million per year for a fixed uh, period. Uh, so with the first of these, the first examples of these contracts um, going into place this year. Uh, so the aim is to give companies a better incentive to develop new antibiotics and hopefully these kinds of models will be adopted internationally so that sufficient global scale is achieved that will attract the necessary investment in R&D. So in closing then, so addressing these scientific, economic and policy factors represents huge challenges and we need multiple disciplines of science to come together with politicians and clinicians uh, and policy makers. And this is of course a uh, formidable but, but critical challenge uh, or we face many lives and, and econ economies impacted by a global AMR pandemic um, in, the, in the coming decades. Uh, so I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for, for your presentation. I, I was really impressed about the figures that you have presented concerning deaths uh, of antimicrobial resistance that could be compared to HIV and malaria together. This is a really impressive. It is clear from your presentation that growing problem or the growing problem of antimicrobial resistance is the result of mu multiple system failures, which required an urgent and collective action as also the previous speaker said, so we need an interdisciplinary action in order to take also to this, uh, this problem. I want to move to the second section uh, of this webinar. Uh, um, the second section is entitled Crisis Preparedness. And uh, this section addresses the issue of surveillance and vaccines, two crucial aspects in the management of pandemics. And the first speaker of uh, the second section is uh, uh, Andrea Moon. Andrea Moon is director of the European Center of Disease, uh, of Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, in uh, Sweden. Previously, she served as a head of a surveillance unit in the same agency. And before joining the CDC, uh, Dr. Moon worked in several roles at the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. The CDC has been very supportive during the pandemic for the member states and the European Commission, uh, providing a scientific background which was crucial for making important political decisions. Dr. Ramon will discuss the development of the surveillance preparedness in the context of the enhancement mandate of the agency. Please, Dr. Ramon. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, for organizing this event and inviting me uh, today. Um, during the past two years, our preparedness plans have been tested more than we ever thought they would be. And the outcome uh, isn't too positive in uh, most of the cases. Uh, so, uh, we have identified uh, gaps that exist um, and um, uh, uh, are now in the process where to see what uh, worked and what could have worked better. Now, um, while the pandemic is not yet over, it is in a, in, in a new phase and this phase would al will allow us to uh, do after action reviews. Um, to uh, as a first step to see um, what we need for a future um, uh, preparedness um, uh, crisis. Uh, can I please have the slide uh, that I uh, leave for the whole presentation uh, for my whole presentation because it structures uh, a bit the um, uh, my talk. So the first one is uh, to review the actions. Um, they will help us to find a rational way addressing the gaps that uh, that we see and many of the lessons that we uh, uh, learn from the pandemic are also transferable to other health threats as mentioned by Ilaria and Jeremy just now. 
Uh, one of the major learnings uh, for the future uh, health emergency preparedness planning is that um, the response needs to be dynamic and uh, a sectorial, so not only health sector and multidisciplinary preparedness approach uh, that also acknowledges both the circular health uh, that uh, Ilaria presented, but also uh, risk um, uh, factors and drivers of risk like globalization and climate change. So uh, one thing that we should learn um, uh, from this pandemic is that um, uh, investment in public health systems is, is, is absolutely necessary. These, um, uh, this, these investments that we have seen in the past years in public health, we paid the price now a little bit for that. And um, in order to prepare, for instance, uh, the surveillance uh, uh, systems uh, better um, and put resilience into the health systems, major investments, as I said, are needed. Because we have seen during the pandemic that we have compared data um, uh, but sometimes the data came too late and uh, they are definitely uh, often not comparable. So that is what we need. Timely, reliable and comparable data. Now for um, uh, uh, modernizing the surveillance, what we need is to look into how we can harness the developments of digitalization. So that in the end, we have um, uh, uh, empowered patients, but also an increased efficiency and uh, uh, cost savings in healthcare. So we will work more closely with member states to uh, see uh, what are those country specific needs um, and um, uh, where are uh, the um, uh, methods and standards um, uh, 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 necessary at the EU level so that uh, the, the comparability can be enhanced. We have asked our uh, ECDC advisory forum uh, earlier this year what they would see as um, um, uh, priority uh, knowledge gaps that needs to be, need to be um, uh, uh, filled now to guide policy actions in the near future. And they basically identify three areas. First, the systematic evaluation of measures, meaning effectiveness, but also cost effectiveness and the acceptability for, uh, from a behavioral and social uh, perspective. Uh, second, well, behavioral and social science research to see what are the drivers that facilitate or inhibit population acceptance or adherence uh, to public health interventions. And lastly, research into novel surveillance and monitoring strategy um, uh, to, that should also include a translation re uh, research to integrate monitoring systems into a coherent system of, of um, uh, uh, a crisis response. So the pandemic has shown us also where our limitations lie. As an agency, as an EU agency, um, we do not have risk management role in the European public health architecture, meaning that we can only provide recommendations and options for actions to policymakers at European and national level. And even with our proposed amended mandate, that will not substantially change because this uh, uh, goes back to the competency division in health between member states and the EU uh, in the Lisbon Treaty. So uh, this new, uh, uh, well, the amended mandate is still uh, not yet adopted, but um, we that uh, it will come before the summer and this mandate will allow us to take a stronger role in supporting EU member states uh, with state-of-the-art surveillance for future outbreaks uh, to do more joint preparedness and response planning with member states and provide a bit stronger guidance during um, emergencies. We have also uh, the uh, opportunity to offer enhanced support 
uh, uh, to, to, through a deployed EU health task force that we will build up and uh, will reinforce our international role. A very important uh, element is also that uh, the medicines agency and ECDC are tasked together to build up a new vaccine safety and effectiveness monitoring platform. So um, we have also seen, and that is probably a one of the major lessons for me, that um, uh, it is very important to add community engagement uh, at the center of any public health response. And that this needs to be embedded in our preparedness plans with trust as a core component, and it needs to start before the crisis. Build this during the crisis, because neither scientists and politicians alone can combat such crisis and respond to crisis. You, we need the population uh, on our side, and that requires careful risk and crisis communication. Um, we have seen that uh, everybody has a role for the future. We have to collaborate together um, and uh, um, uh, we have to capitalize on each other's experience because um, uh, this uh, cooperation will be key uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, the response to future health crisis as no country can cope with a global crisis alone. And only if we are prepared together, we're also safe together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amun, for this presentation. Uh, I think that in the second part of the of this uh, meeting, we have uh, uh, the possibility to discuss again about your talk. And I, I am sure that there, there will be several questions. And uh, for example, the question of potential overlapping between different uh, on the mandate of ECDC, EMA, HERA agencies in in their work. Let me say that you said that. Uh, ECDC uh, needs a timing, comparable and reliable data. And uh, I hope that our member states, your member states are ready uh, after this pandemic to provide this, uh, this information. Uh, the second speaker, uh, I move on to the second speaker of this session. Uh, that is Nicola Collan, uh, CEO of the Vaccine Formulation Institute, a non-profit institute dedicated to vaccine adjuvants. Previously, uh, Nicola uh, worked at the National Institute of Health in the US uh, and at the WHO in the Influenza Vaccine Task Force during the 2009 influenza pandemic. In his presentation, Nicola uh, mainly reported the experience of the Vaccine Formulation Institute during the pandemic crisis. Please, Nicola. Thank you very much, uh, Gianluca. Good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks for, for this invitation. Many thanks to COST and the organizers. So I will share with you the um, experience of the Vaccine Formulation Institute during the pandemic crisis and few lessons that we can take for the next pandemics uh, to come when it comes to vaccine development. As you just said, Gianluca, uh, VFI is a non-for-profit institute in Switzerland was initially created in 2012 under the auspices of the World Health Organization with a mandate to work on vaccine adjuvants and vaccine formulation for the benefit of the entire vaccine community. So very shortly, adjuvants, these are the substances that you add into vaccines, such as protein-based vaccines or inactivated viruses-based vaccines, and they help vaccines to work better. Uh, adjuvants can decrease their cost. Uh, can prolong the immune response induces by these vaccines or simply improve the number of doses, augment the number of doses that you can get with one given vaccine. There are really key ingredients in, in the era of, of the modern vaccinology. And one example among many others is the matrix M adjuvant uh, present in the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine uh, recently approved in Europe. On the other hand, vaccine formulation, is the science uh, which helps you to package a vaccine and introduce it to the body such that it is stable and, and effective. And 
One example is the mRNA vaccines uh, from Pfizer, BioNTech, or from Moderna, which require a very specific formulation system called lipid nanoparticles, which which are crucial for, for the vaccines to be effective and, uh, and stable. So our institute is developing adjuvants on an open access model, which means that they are made available to all vaccine developers worldwide. And we also support, as I just said, the vaccine developers uh, with their formulation uh, for their vaccine candidates. We received fundings uh, for these activities for the last 10 years from the European Commission, from FP7, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, from BARDA, from the Gates Foundation, and, and from CEPI uh, quite recently, the Coalition for Epidemics uh, Preparedness Innovations. So what happened in practice during the COVID-19 response for us, and what can we learn from this experience? So for, I will highlight three main points. The first one is, uh, you need to have an established network and an established uh, framework in advance of the pandemic. The second one is you need to secure your materials and your expertise in advance of the pandemic. And the third one is you have, you need to have your technology validated in humans already in advance of the pandemic. So very concretely in February, 2020, we started to work rapidly uh, with many different vaccine developers worldwide who sent us their vaccine candidates. Um, and that was mostly coordinated by the Gates Foundation at the time, who, who, who did a, a rather good job really to help us to be in direct interaction with all the different vaccine manufacturers, developers from many institutions in the world. Uh, that has allowed to work with people that were already in a strong network that were knowing each other and all of these direct interactions that allowed to really really to move fast another enabling factor for us was that we had funding in advance we did not require funding we did not chase for calls for proposal we had already a core funding for our technological platform that was recurrently um, provided to work on, on projects with this network of vaccine developers. And that was basically allocated overnight immediately to the pandemic response. So that's that's really an interesting model that, that we've uh, thought to be very effective. On the other hand, we received, I would say fewer requests from the European vaccine developers. And we observed that there was probably a bit more fragmentation or more fractionated work from, from that end. So I just want to, to finish on that first point on the network to, to mention, of course, that we've been um, coordinating this cost action called the European Network of Vaccine Adjuvants, which is federating many different institutions in, in Europe working on adjuvants. And, and that really allows not to have a network for a network. It, it allows a network to create real working relationships because when the pandemic starts, obviously, you are not going to start networking. You are going to work with people you know already and with whom you, you, you can really function well. So the second aspect after building your network in advance is uh, to secure your material in advance and the supply chain issues that we have just heard previously. So just right, few weeks after uh, the beginning of the pandemic, we started to generate the results with the various vaccine candidates. and identified early on some uh, good adjuvanted vaccine combination and decided to upscale very rapidly uh, one of our adjuvant. And this pandemic adjuvant has been upscaled to industry scale manufacturer uh, by our partner CEPIC, a company in France, part of the early quit group. And again, this is illustrating the fact that we built on already long-standing collaborations and already established partnerships in advance. What this has helped us is to make sure that the raw materials for the key ingredients of these achievements would be secured. And CEPIC was very rapidly able to uh, have an industrial scale clinical grade adjuvant with an annual capacity of several hundreds million doses if a billion doses per day. So we heard about the supply chain. We've observed that many vaccine developers hit a, a lot of issues when it comes to provision of raw material, key ingredients of vaccines. There was shortage of these raw materials. There were a fair use competition to access 
key elements of vaccines. So I think the lesson learned here is really in advance of a pandemic to secure these materials, this expertise, and this support chains. And my last point is to have your technology validated in advance. We then used our pandemic adjuvant and, and, and entered into clinical trials with some vaccine developers what excellent vaccine candidates based on proteins such as Vido Intervac in Canada. And then here we hit a, a major issue, which was that our adjuvant was never tested before in humans. And the regulators who have ensured the safety of the vaccine developed, even though during it was a, during a pandemic time, uh, did not allow uh, us to do clinical trials uh, simultaneously for different cohorts, but sequentially. And that has, of course, delayed uh, very significantly the phase one that was started early 2021 and which is still not finished. So it has taken almost two years for this clinical trial of phase one, which is, by the way, a rather classical uh, timing for clinical trials be before pandemics. So uh, basically, when you look at our uh, the RNA vaccines uh, from Pfizer, BioNTech, or from Moderna, or the viral vectors from University of Oxford, AstraZeneca, went rapidly under development. It's really uh, because these vaccines were tested in clinical trials in human and had a lot of pharmacology data already demonstrating that these platforms were safe and effective in humans. What you just do upon a pandemic in that case is you use this platform and switch it uh, to develop uh, a vaccine against the, the new pandemic agent. So in short, I think it's really essential that, that most of the technological platforms in Europe, vaccine developers, uh, developers, and, and many more uh, ca can receive uh, some funding, I would say, to maintain an expertise, test regularly clinical trials uh, with their technologies, and have many options when a pandemic uh, strikes again, uh, and make sure that uh, we will be ready uh, for the for the next ones to come. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for, for this presentation that come directly from your experience during, during the crisis. Uh, the pandemics has revealed that the weaknesses of the vaccine ecosystem in Europe and improving the availability of vaccine can only be achieved, uh, as you said, uh, by a strong commitment of industry and public sector willing to invest more uh, uh, in, in this field. We are perfectly in time, it's two o'clock, and I wanted to start with section three uh, of this uh, uh, webinar. And in the third and the, uh, final section, we discuss uh, the crisis management and the response. The international health regulation are binding treaty negotiated by the WHO. This treaty regulated the conduct of countries before and during the global public health emergencies. The pandemic has revealed weaknesses in the implementation of the international health regulations. Many people supported the idea that the rule of the international health regulation should or perhaps must be rewritten. In her presentation, Sylvie Brian uh, will discuss all these issues. Sylvie Brian is director uh, of the Epidemic and uh, Pandemic Preparedness and the Prevention Department at the WHO in Geneva. Uh, the department develops global strategies to prevent and control infectious diseases under international health regulations. Please, Dr. Brian. Okay, uh, good afternoon uh, or uh, good evening, or I don't know what time it is. <laughs> where you are. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to uh, briefly touch on this uh, important subject indeed, um, because a pandemic, as we have seen, is, uh, is a, an event that can affect any countries in the world. And um, currently, all countries actually have been uh, uh, facing difficulties with this pandemic. And so um, we have seen during this pandemic that what is really important is first that each country is well prepared 
but we need also for a pandemic event that there is a, a, a global coordination uh, between countries. And so uh, this is uh, what the IHR is supposed to do. IHR was uh, adopted in 2005 by all our member states, uh, came into force in 2007. And the aim of the revised IHR was really uh, not only to accelerate uh, the process of detecting uh, new outbreaks with pandemic potential, uh, but also uh, to ensure that there is a, a global coordination of the response and uh, also what is important is that uh, we can have, um, uh, I mean, this treaty uh, can also be somehow the, the framework uh, for this international uh, uh, collaboration. So um, the first pandemic that we had to deal with the IHR was the 2009 pandemic, uh, the flu pandemic. Uh, then we had uh, used it for uh, polio, for Ebola, uh, for Zika, and uh, now uh, for COVID-19. Uh, but we have seen that um, uh, for this pandemic, uh, it was not optimal uh, because even with the IHR and some mechanism in place, uh, we have seen that, for instance, there have been a lot of um, um, uh, travel bans and, and uh, border closure, uh, which is uh, uh, not necessarily uh, what was um, uh, needed. And uh, the IHR was adopted uh, exactly for this purpose, I mean, to have a, a correct, uh, I mean, or balanced public health response so that we can avoid those kind of um, um, impact on travel and business. So um, based on that, uh, member states uh, of the WHO, the 194 member states of the WHO are discussing how can we uh, get better prepared for the next pandemic. And of course, there is a need to do a lot of things and fix a lot of issues uh, before the next event. We don't know when it will come, but we just know that um, that will be all the pandemic, uh, just because that the drivers of pandemics and risk uh, are increasing globally. And so uh, it's very likely that we will have another pandemic uh, uh, in this century. So uh, currently, there are many processes ongoing, many fora for discussion for member states. One is the WGPR, which is a working group on pandemic preparedness and response. It is uh, chaired by USA and Indonesia, and uh, they had the two uh, functions. Uh, one is um, uh, provide a report to the uh, WHA, the World uh, Health Assembly, last year on the opportunity to develop a new instrument to uh, face pandemics. And the second uh, task of this group was to look at the 131 recommendations that have been issued by various uh, review panel and uh, help uh, member states to uh, uh, decide uh, how to uh, take those recommendations and, and to uh, implement uh, improvement for the next uh, pandemic. So these 131 recommendations are now grouped in four uh, buckets. Uh, one is the leadership and governance. Second bucket is systems and tools. The third bucket is about equity. And the fourth one is about financing. And so uh, they will issue their report before the WHA uh, that will happen uh, at the end of uh, a week after next. So um, this is one of the fora. But there is another fora that is, uh, has been also um, um, uh, created, is the intergovernmental negotiating body. So uh, based on the recommendation or on the um, text provided by the WGPR at the last assembly, uh, member states decided to have this uh, intergovernmental negotiating body to uh, work on this new instrument that will uh, help uh, the world to be better prepared for the next pandemic. So this new instrument, they are discussing two things. The first is uh, how this new instrument fits with the WHO, um, um, the WHO, uh, oh, I can't remember, uh, the WHO uh, constitution, sorry. And the second uh, discussion they have is on the content of this new instrument. So uh, why uh, it's important to discuss um, uh, this new instrument in view uh, to the WHO constitution is because there are different articles in the WHO constitution that can uh, host such agreements and uh, each 
article uh, has a different uh, uh, implication. Uh, so the first one is the article 19, and uh, it's really uh, for an instrument uh, a, a treaty or a, a convention framework, and uh, we call it the opt-in. It means that a member states will uh, choose if they want to sign uh, this uh, new instrument, and uh, this instrument will come into force, for instance, if we decide that uh, it can come into force if, for instance, uh, 50 member states have signed it. Uh, the second article is uh, Article 21, and this is about opt-out. So it means that uh, if it's adopted at the WHA, all countries are part of it, but countries can opt out and say, no, I don't want to uh, be part of it. Uh, or they can make reservation about certain articles uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the instrument. So uh, IHR, the International Health Regulation, is linked to uh, when it's about um, Article 21. So it's an opt-out uh, instrument. Um, and uh, so both um, the Article 19 or Article 21 uh, will uh, generate uh, instruments that are legally binding for all our member states. And there is the last article, which is uh, Article 23, uh, and this one is not binding for member states, but it's binding for the WHO Secretariat, which means that if it's adopted by our member states, uh, WHO Secretariat is, uh, uh, has to put it in place. And uh, this Article uh, 23 is the one that provides the framework for uh, usually the recommendation or the resolution that are adopted during the uh, WHA. So um, there is a third group, a third forum where uh, the member states are discussing and it's really to um, uh, adapt uh, the IHR, the current IHR, and see uh, if we can modify certain articles of this um, uh, instrument uh, to make it uh, uh, more adapted to the current situation. So there are currently 13 uh, articles of the IHR that are being discussed, and uh, the discussion is still ongoing, so I cannot give you any deadlines about it. Uh, in parallel of that, I'm just looking at the time, but you tell me if I speak too much. <laughs> uh, in parallel of that, uh, in preparation for this assembly, our Director General, Dr. Ted Rose, has prepared a, a white paper for consultation with member states called uh, Strengthening the Global Architecture for Health Emergency Preparedness, Response and Resilience. So this document is on our website, and I think someone will put the link uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, and so this document is really uh, it's more technical, I would say, or go more into the detail of what can we do to be better prepared for the next pandemic. Uh, it highlights uh, a number of um, uh, domains where we uh, uh, need to improve and, and it provides a sort of a framework for all member states to review uh, what system they have in place and then uh, fix the, the problems, but also uh, uh, understand uh, how we can uh, also anticipate the next pandemic because it's very likely that the next pandemic will be very different from this one. So, of course, we need to fix the problem we have encountered this time, but we need also to imagine what could be the next pandemic and, and uh, just anticipate also what kind of uh, systems and tools we we'll need to have in place uh, to be better placed. So um, I think what is important in those different fora is to understand that um, every country in the world, I think, has struggled with this pandemic and it's not finished. We hope to finish the acute phase of this pandemic soon, but uh, there are many lessons to be learned. Uh, last pandemic in 2009, uh, there was a very good lessons, uh, but unfortunately, uh, there have been in some countries that uh, they have been uh, learned and and some uh, uh, measures have been implemented. But in many countries, um, we uh, have seen the cycle of uh, uh, panic and neglect. And after two or three years after the last pandemic, uh, uh, countries just drop. Um, uh, their plans, they didn't update it, and, and, and so um, this is why also now we, we are uh, in, a, in a situation that is, is, is quite difficult. So I think it's important to uh, learn the lesson, but also implement them and maintain uh, this preparedness uh, uh, attitude uh, for a long time, because uh, uh, pandemics are really unpredictable and, and we cannot uh, 
uh, just drop everything at once. We need to maintain a lot of things. So in conclusion, I think the, the conversation uh, between member states are, are focusing on, okay, what should be done, but also um, the equity is really at the center of their discussion, especially when it's about uh, a global collaboration. Uh, the trust issue, uh, because we have seen a lot, uh, an epidemic of mistrust as well during this pandemic, and also the issue of data sharing, information sharing, because uh, it's very much linked to the trust, of course, but uh, it's a very important thing. And, and, um, and trust and, and data sharing, uh, it's also part of the preparedness. Uh, you will increase the trust if you, have, if you are used to work together, you increase the collaboration if you are used to discuss and communicate together, uh, and you cannot start this kind of relationship when uh, there is a crisis, it's too late. So we have to start now to get ready for the next pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sylvie, for this presentation. So um, let me say that a new treaty is, is a greatly, greatly welcome, but uh, we know also that the negotiation of a new treaty can take, can take a long time and sometimes years. Uh, we hope that this will not be the case for in, the, in, this, in this discussion. Thank you. I, I am sure that we will be, we'll have the opportunity to discuss also the question and answer session. Please stay with us. And uh, the last speaker is uh, Clément Evro. Clément is a policy analyst of the European Parliamentary Research Service. He has an experience in research, space and health. Uh, Clément has previously worked uh, for the French Ministry for Education and Research, and he also has an experience in DG research of the European Commission. And uh, he, in, uh, in his presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Evro presents uh, how the European Commission has responded to the pandemic so far. Please, Clément. Many thanks. Good afternoon to uh, everybody. So, yes, I would like with my presentation to outline the EU response to this COVID-19 pandemic. As it has been said uh, in precedently, COVID-19 pandemic is a systemic crisis. Discussing the response to it from design to implementation allows assessing its present resilience, but also the capacity of the Union to address all the looming systemic challenges such as advancing on the United Nations 2030 agenda. So my presentation will start by summarizing the early answer to the COVID-19 pandemic by the EU. Then I would like to assess the comprehensive approach to pandemic preparedness enabled by the recent Health Union initiative. And then I will finish by outlining a couple of co-benefits or dividends of the response in future-proofing the Union. So I would like to start now to explain how the EU has joined forces to uh, provide an early EU answer through a whole of, a whole of government approach. First, a couple of um, figures. So far, the COVID-19 has determined a wide range of adverse impacts. The last estimate by WHO on excess mortality ranged from 13.3 million to 16.6 .6 million globally in 2020 and 2021. When it comes to the economic impact, in January 22, the International Monetary Fund estimates that the global economic loss due to this pandemic is about at 12.25 trillion euro. So the pandemic and the magnitude of its social economical effect put emphasis on the EU added value in pooling resources, both of tangible and intangible uh, nature. Overall, the joint efforts have taken place across a wide range of sectoral, sectoral policy, such as public health, transport, the internal market, research, education, and trade. Essentially, the initiative follows two sets of overarching objectives. First, supporting knowledge creation and industrial solution to develop medical countermeasures. Second, mitigating the socio-economical effects arising 
arising from the crisis and the countermeasures to it, such as the lockdowns. I would like now to quote very briefly two very relevant uh, policy vehicles. First, the emergency support instrument that was activated in April 2020. It has allocated 2.7 billion euro to support member states in their immediate response. This scheme has allowed notably to transport patients and medical staff across the EU, but also to, to procure essential medicines and medical equipment. It also supported research and innovation to produce treatment, including vaccine, and it developed and distributed test supplies. The second vehicle I would like to quote is the European Instrument for Temporary Support to Mitigating Unemployment Risk, also known as SURE. It was adopted in May 2020, and so far it has supported approximately 31 million workers across the EU, which represents not less than 25% of the total number of people employed in the overall 19 beneficiary member states. Joining forces also implies to build on the active contribution from a wider range of socio-economical actors, as it has been said, and to reflect appropriately the different levels of governance of the Union. For instance, the relevance of citizen engagement in the answer to a COVID-19 pandemic is gaining prominence. I would like to quote uh, an excerpt of the joint statement on the launch of the Conference of the Future that read, Europe can and must also learn the lessons from this crisis closely involving citizens and communities. Then, to steer this whole of a government response, the EU uh, answer to the COVID-19 pandemic has also been designed to benefit from and to contribute to the EU overarching political priority, such as the twin digital and green transition and the EU open strategic autonomy. For example, emerging digital technologies such as high power computing have been harnessed to advance knowledge creation on designing therapeutical countermeasures to the COVID-19. Regarding the European Green Deal, since the probable origin of the COVID-19 is related to endemic zoonosis, the virus highlights, as it, as it has been already mentioned in the discussion this afternoon, the importance of the One Health approach. Then the pandemic has also highlighted the burden of other environmental factors such as pollution. I would like now to present the EU Health Union Initiative, which is a comprehensive institutional framework for flexible solutions. In November 2020, the Commission has tabled this package to ensure the EU response and preparedness to health emergencies. It is based on four legislative initiatives and one Commission decision. They all draw lessons from the early EU answer. The two first regulations announce the respective mandate of the EMA and ECDC. The third resolution, on the contrary, the regulation on serious cross-border threats, aims to improve the overall preparedness and response. The Commission will be in charge of coordinating and monitoring the preparation of EU crisis and pandemic preparedness plan that will, which scope will range beyond um, the health consideration. Then I would say last but not least regarding those four legislative proposals, we have one council regulation on the emergency framework of measures for answering the supply of crisis relevant medical countermeasures. This text in a sense codifies the lesson learned from the early uh, response to COVID-19 pandemic. It ensures the design and deployment of medical countermeasures while also answering the resilience of the economy and society. Parallel to this legislation, the Commission decision that established the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, also known as ERA, 
has attributed to this new service the role, the main role in coordinating preparedness. But this coordinating role is taking place at the interface between science, industry, and society. It is, as a consequence, also relevant to bolstering the EU open strategic autonomy. ERA activity will rely on two main intervention logic. On one hand, a preparedness phase where ERA will steer investment and action towards strengthening prevention, preparedness, and readiness. Under the crisis mode, on the contrary, KIRA will draw on stronger power for swift decision making and implementation of emergency measures in relation with the Council regulation I mentioned a couple of, of seconds. Since I suppose that the time is limited, I would like now to uh, outline co-benefit of this EU response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. First, on the global role of EU, and second, on its future proofing. So far, the EU is the world's largest exporter of COVID-19 vaccine, with over 2.1 billion finished doses. They have been exported to more than 160 countries. And Team Europe has committed close to 6 Euro billion euro to the access to COVID tool accelerator, a WHO initiative. More generally, Team Europe has mobilized almost 46 billion euro to support partner countries in facing the health emergency, but as well in harnessing a socio-economical uh, response to it. Then, I would like to stress that international cooperation and research innovation contribute also to the global preparedness for future pandemics. Beyond COVID-19, I would like to give here two uh, examples of res EU research and innovation uh, initiative. First, an example of the European and developing country cl clinical trial partnership. This partnership has been existing since 2003, and in October 2021, uh, WHO recommended a widespread use of a malaria vaccine, so-called RTS, S, among children in Africa. This is a direct result of EU investment in this DCTP partnership that has supported up to 64 research projects between 24 and 2020 in the framework of Horizon 2020. A DCTP tree will continue to support similar collaborative research from 21 to 27. The second example that I would like to give uh, is uh, related more to social science. It is actually a cost action entitled Geography of New Working Spaces and Impact on the Periphery. This project with 35 partners, including 20 partners established in member states, but partners established also in Argentina, Lebanon, and the US, will look into the future of work, indicating that the EU research innovation investments can really provide this uh, overall uh, toolbox for enhancing our preparedness, but as well prepare, sharing it globally. Then I would like to finish with a consideration on digitalization in the sense that the COVID-19 answer has facilitated the further digitalization of health and research. It has demonstrated the importance of digital services in the health domain, but it has also very much emphasized the importance of specific sci EU science priorities regarding uh, digital technology, such as the FAIR principle. FAIR principle is a scientific methodology, and um, more broadly, a, method a methodology that wants to uh, increase open data by making sure that every data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Then we can also see that in recent legislative initiative, the role of health as a critical sector of the EU has been announced. This is notably uh, the case in the recent directive on critical uh, entities. 
I would like now to conclude uh, with three points. Three point. First point, as uh, it is mentioned, it is time to act now, first to harness the momentum to curb COVID-19, but also to uh, ensure that the right government's arrangement of found and established between the institution I mentioned related to the Health Union Agency. It is notably the case regarding the way the Parliament will be able to uh, provide its uh, control and monitoring competence over it. And then I would like also to uh, uh, echo what was said in the first round of discussion regarding the transformative nature of uh, the pandemic. It is as well important to look at the repandity of our answer to draw lessons to advance on our overall sustainability agenda. Many thanks. Clement, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for this overview. So after a, a difficult start, so the, the European Union was able to provide a lot of actions uh, on the health sector that uh, health sector that has been a little bit neglected before the pandemic that uh, we hope that health will be a major topic also also for the future we are uh, perfectly in time and uh, we open now the uh, session of question and answers there are uh, already a number of questions from the chat I would like to start with a question to Professor Capua. Uh, Ilaria, you are the director of uh, uh, one health center uh, uh, of excellence, but you adv advocate uh, a new concept, a new disruptive concept. Um, you are uh, an eminent scientist, but also you have uh, you have a, a, an important experience as a policy maker. In your opinion, what could be the major bottleneck in developing a strong uh, uh, one health or circular health approach? Thank you. Um, thank you, Gianluca. Uh, yes, I am. I call myself a politically modified organism because I have spent over three and a half years in the Italian Parliament, and so I have been exposed to uh, the contradictions and the difficulties of matching science and policy. Um, as I as I said, um, I I really do think that COVID nineteen is a transformational event, and um, I do think that actually as public health. Um, scientists and, and uh, people who operate in this field or are interested in this field, we actually have a foot in the door to change things and, and to go towards uh, exactly, I mean, a lot of the things that have been said today uh, are perfectly in line with the circular health vision. The circular health vision recognizes the empowerment of citizens because um, we need to um, we, we, we need to use the power that they have, because if we can make uh, our citizens understand, for example, that vaccination is uh, brings you towards prevention and antibiotics uh, instead are used for cure and should only be used in certain circumstances, we can actually really start moving things. So. The empowerment of citizens is absolutely essential. I think we've learned with COVID-19 and also Europe is, uh, is the European Union and Euro Europe is a country that has a demographic that are very um, towards an aging population and therefore we need to prevent because we cannot cure. We, we do not have the resources to cure and we have seen how hard COVID-19 has hit our demographics. So um, I, I think that circular health is the natural expansion of the One Health concept. One Health remains the core, and the core of the reasoning is that we need to, to um, operate understanding that we are in a closed system. And therefore, uh, we need 
to, th there are certain things that were acceptable to the generations before us, but that are not acceptable to us and that are absolutely not acceptable to um, the new generations. And we have the responsibility of addressing these issues because there are many things on the table on top of pandemics, of course, and just to mention one little issue, climate change. So I would like to see um, attempts to manage uh, diseases which encompass many aspects, not only the human animal interface, but as we have said, encompass, for example, other macro dynamics that are linked both as a positive and as a negative to digitalization. And we should not forget that COVID-19 is the most measured event in history. We have never measured anything like we have measured COVID-19. And so we have the data. I have spent a lot of a, a long time of my career uh, promoting and championing data sharing and data interoperability. And we now have the computing capacities, we have the storage capacities, and we have generated an immense amount of data. We need to funnel this data in a circular approach, under, which recognizes once again that we need to co-advance the health of humans, animals, plants, and the environment. And we need to do that this through a roadmap, which in my view can, can only be the Sustainable Development Goal Roadmap. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Laria, for, for the uh, contribution. So uh, we need a, a, an holistic approach for, for, for the future in order to, to tackle the, 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 the problem that uh, pandemic and other potential health threats uh, can provide to us. Uh, there are uh, in the chat there are a number of questions uh, for uh, for Jeremy Webb and and uh, 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 Jeremy uh, one of these is is the following: What are in your opinion the best and the worst scenarios going forward with antimicrobial resistance, and what uh, can do uh, as individuals so every one of us to combat antimicrobial resistance? Thank you. Thank you for that for that question. Well, I, I think in terms of the worst scenarios, I, I, partly as I out, outlined in my in, intervention, is that the scenario where problems with market access mean that there simply isn't the incentive for private sector investment or companies to uh, to develop new antimicrobials, and, and, and we don't have replacements for the for the new drugs. Uh, the, for the drugs that are that we lose to to resistance, um, and in many cases there are examples where you know, the the last resort drugs um, uh, are failing, and you know so so there are not cure cures for certain types of bacterial infection. Um, so what that means is that the market access challenges means that the it currently the you know the academic sort of you know site the drug discovery and development efforts are really the sort of primary source of, of new discoveries and, and new drugs to you know not necessarily the private sector um, so i think the for, from a, from my perspective as a, as a scientist you know the hope is that you know joined up approaches um uh, such that Industry and pharma can fully access you know, all the, the smart things that are happening in in in, in universities. Uh, you know models that you know build critical mass of you know capability and infrastructure. Uh, you know by working working across institutions and and and, and joined up approaches. Um, and you know and secondly, you, you, it, it's about you know, speed and many of much of this has been referred to today. It's you know speeding up. Uh, the, the the drug the clinical drug development process you know to deliver some of these smart ideas that are that are coming out of universities uh, more quickly um, you know, how to speed up the clinical drug development process uh, shortening the preclinical and clinical development 
you know, can we condense the drug development timelines by performing, you know, the steps in, in parallel, you know, many of the things that we've been discussing. Um, so those are sort of, you know, the pessimistic and, and, and op optimistic sort of approaches. Um, Thank you. And, and what could be done, in your opinion, at the individual level in order to reduce the problem of antimicrobial resistance? Well, I think at the individual level, I think, well, there's a, there's certainly a, a major piece around uh, education. That I think that's, that's clear. I think it, it's something I come across very often is that still there's a perception among public that antibiotic resistance is, is something that happens to them. You know, it's, it, uh, uh, you know, to, to an individual, it's, it's part of us right? rather than something that happens to the microorganism and, and educating people around AMR and stewardship of, uh, yeah, antimicrobials, uh, you know, that, that is key because, you yeah, know, much of the antibiotic use, you yeah, uh, by the public, yeah, drives antibiotic selection and, um, and new resistant strains. So ed education, I think, is, is, is key. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for, for this contribution. Um, there are uh, a couple of questions for Dr. Ramon. Um, um, Andrea, you said that uh, the ECDC has a new potential mandate. Uh, uh, some uh, attendants would like to know if uh, with the new mandate uh, um, there is the risk or there could be the risk of an overlapping between different EU agencies, specifically uh, EMA and HERA. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. That uh, question is not the first time that I hear that. Um, so uh, with EMA, um, it is um, quite uh, clearly defined that uh, EMA is working on vaccine safety uh, and we are working more on vaccine uh, effectiveness. Uh, so that's the understanding that we have, uh, uh, and we are currently in the process of um, um, uh, uh, developing a memorandum of understanding to clearly delineate uh, the, the tasks that each agency has to deliver what is in our respective mandates uh, now, now enshrined. Uh, so that also our stakeholders know what they can expect from which agency. Now with HERA, the uh, the uh, the scope uh, uh, is um, <clears throat> uh, on medical countermeasure preparedness, uh, be uh, because that was seen as a as a gap at the EU level uh, at the beginning of the of the uh, pandemic to procure, purchase, stockpile, distribute um, uh, uh, um, medical countermeasures. Uh, and also HERA has um, uh, an ECDC because our mandate is just for infectious diseases, whereas HERA uh, scope includes um, uh, also uh, um, a radiological, chemical and all other health threats. Now, um, while this is sort of uh, theoretically clear, there is, of course, then also an area where also with HERA, we are currently in the process of um, uh, lining out who does what in the area of infectious diseases in terms of the assessment of health threats and intelligence gathering, because this is what HERA needs in order to know what are the medical countermeasures that they need to prepare for. Uh, strengthening the um, uh, uh, coordination within the EU during uh, preparedness and crisis response. We have to uh, see who does what. Um, strengthening the knowledge and skills in um, in preparedness and response, and also the coordination with our uh, international partners outside of the EU. So there are some areas where it's necessary to uh, clearly delineate the division of work, which we are currently in the process to do. Uh, thank you, Andrea. There is a, another question that so I want to, to immediately convey to you. If during the pandemic uh, there was a good uh, collaboration between ECDC and EC uh, and the similar agency in the US. Yes, uh, in fact, not only with the US CDC, but we had a whole network 
of um, uh, CDCs around the world because uh, the pandemic the, uh, had uh, its peak uh, uh, in different uh, parts of the world at different times. So we could exchange actually our, our uh, experience and um, uh, learn from each other. That started with uh, China, Singapore, South Korea, um uh, uh at the beginning and then we we had of course we have a memorandum of understanding with uh with uh, the us cdc since 2007 i think so very very long uh back uh, but now we have also new partners um, uh, with um, uh, uh, the Africa CDC. Uh, with um, we are in discussion with Australia, uh, so so that we even f uh, further can can extend our our interaction because it has proven valuable to have direct access to exchange on on topics like uh, mask wearing, um, uh, vaccine rollout, and these kind of things. Thank you. Thank you for, for your uh, uh, contribution. Uh, Sylvie, there is a, a question for you. Um, uh, we know that the negotiation could be, particularly in the parliament, uh, could be, could be uh, difficult, uh, could be a difficult exercise. Based on your experience, what could be the major difficulties in developing a new treaty? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, well, <clears throat> we we had an experience of negotiation after the previous pandemic, and it was a negotiation of the pandemic influenza preparedness framework. And uh, it um, it started a bit before the pandemic, and uh, the negotiation finished uh, after the pandemic, and the member state adopted this. Um, uh, resolution uh, in uh, May 2011. Uh, so it took approximately uh, five years to negotiate. It was um, a negotiation that was um, a bit long indeed. Uh, first, I think because at that time we didn't have uh, all the uh, technology to have uh, virtual meetings. So every time member states were meeting, it was uh, on site, and we had to um, uh, move uh, uh, 194 delegations for the discussion. So it was uh, logistically uh, quite uh, cumbersome. Uh, but member states managed to um, uh, reach an agreement after the pandemic. And, um, and the main um, achievement of the pandemic influenza preparedness framework is that it puts on the equal footing the sharing of viruses and the sharing of benefits. So it's really an access and benefit sharing uh, mechanism that has been endorsed by all member states. And um, it has been, in my opinion, extremely successful because um, uh, the private partners, industry, uh, as uh, committed for two uh, two things. The first thing is that they provide every year um, $28 million for preparedness. And uh, so they contribute to preparedness. And secondly, um, we have a signed contract with uh, 30 um, private uh, manufacturers uh, so that they can uh, set aside a certain uh, proportion of their production real time in case of a pandemic so that uh, low-income countries can have access to uh, vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics. So um, it was a major breakthrough in terms of equity, uh, also in terms of preparedness, because, uh, because preparedness has been funded since then, since 2011. Actually, all the, the uh, progress uh, we have seen during this pandemic were due to this uh, effort before the pandemic. For instance, the fact that many countries, uh, developing countries, were able to diagnose COVID-19 was due to the fact that we had uh, strengthened their laboratory capacities for the past 10 years. So five years seems long, uh, but I think compared to what has been achieved through this negotiation, I thought it was uh, quite, uh, quite an achievement, actually. Um, this time, uh, member states have uh, 
so I've decided that the, this uh, intergovernmental um, uh, negotiating body, INB, uh, will be the, the body negotiating the new instrument. And currently, uh, the deadline is until uh, May uh, 2023 for uh, the start of the negotiation and uh, the development of a draft um, agreement. So um, I think currently the INB is discussing more uh, which kind of um, uh, process uh, will be um, uh, adopted because, uh, as I said before, it's either Article 19 or 21 uh, that are being discussed currently. But once member states have decided which kind of, um, of um, instrument they will uh, develop, then they will work on the content and hopefully we'll have very soon a uh, very high level document that will enable. So I think it will be more a framework. It will not go into details, but it will lay out the major principle for the next pandemic and in particular how uh, all member states will collaborate. So the major obstacle are these uh, procedures, I think, uh, but also the fact that, as you know, the world is uh, currently very fragmented. Uh, there are a number of tensions. Uh, many places in the world where you have war, uh, I mean, real war or just economic uh, tensions and war. So um, let's say that it's, it's not very easy uh, currently, but uh, I hope that uh, everybody will uh, make an effort for pandemic situation because the problem is that, as I said, we really don't know when the next one will come. And if it comes in the coming two years, uh, and if we spend too much time in discussion, then we won't be ready for the next one either. So I think it's it's everybody has a, it's a win-win situation if we uh, move fast. Uh, thank you, Sylvie, for your for your answer. So the, perhaps we have also uh, still the time for a, a, a final question, and I have a question for Nicola Collin. Uh, Nicola, uh, there is one uh, um, person that asks uh, what uh, would be the impact in terms of vaccine response if the next pandemic agent was either an influenza virus or a coronavirus? Thank you. Thanks, Gianluca. So, so if, if the next pandemic was not uh, an influenza or, 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 or corona, uh, I think things would change drastically, at least in terms of vaccine response, because what we've seen uh, in the field of vaccinology is highly disruptive. I think that it was not expected at all by, by the vaccine community that making a vaccine in one year was even conceivable. Uh, please keep in mind that the, the, the previous vaccines uh, were developed in eight years, maximum 10 years, often 50. You may have heard about the, the RTSS vaccine for malaria that was recently approved as, as a major achievement uh, in the history of, 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 of medicine. It has taken 30 years to develop because it's, it's a complex agent to fight against. So I think we need to keep in mind that what we've seen is not of, of what will happen in the future pandemics. We might have bacteria, and that would be a whole different game. Probably RNA vaccines would have very strong limitations against that. We could have uh, retroviruses or many different agents for which uh, vaccines would probably be much harder to develop. So, so, so based on, on this uh, aspect of things, I'd like also to, to re-highlight what, what we've heard, I think, from Professor Webb, is that there is an incredible tissue of know-how in, in our universities in Europe, in the small biotechs, in the larger players, uh, but, but notably in the university and in the small players. Uh, and, and, and leveraging this innovation, leveraging this know-how uh, to be prepared for all possible options and, and make vaccines this life-saving tool, as we've seen during COVID-19, is probably essential. So again, it's reinforcing, I think, the idea of, of having an alliance of all of these uh, players. Uh, keep in mind that many of the vaccines that have been developed for COVID-19 came from university settings. 
AstraZeneca vaccines come from the University of Oxford. Uh, the Gamaleya Sinovac vaccines, they're very strongly linked to universities. Uh, even the Pfizer vaccine comes from BioNTech in Germany, which is very entrenched into local academic institutions. So, so I think a, a, an interesting angle is to see how can we leverage all of these extraordinary know-how that exists in Europe in terms of vaccine development. Uh, and then we can be prepared much better for any kind of, you know, new disease that would, that would arise as future pandemics with, with a variety of, of, of techni technical options. Uh, th thank you, Nicola, for your answer. So apparently we need crisis in order to improve. So because this is also the case for, 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 the, for the commission in, in, uh, in, the, in the health sector. So uh, thank you very much to all speakers for their contributions, really uh, inspiring contributions. I want now to move to the closing remarks and uh, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, our, uh, the Director General of EPRS, Anthony Teasdale, that would like, I guess, to introduce the final two speakers. I hope that Anthony is still with us. Fantastic. Please, Anthony. Well, thank you very much indeed, Gianluca, and to so many of our wonderful uh, contributors during this discussion. It's been extremely stimulating and I, I really feel proud on behalf of EPRS that we've been able to partner with COST and have such a, a serious in-depth discussion about a set of issues which are not only very, very relevant, very pressing, uh, but which give us serious pause for thought in terms of how to ensure that if and when the next pandemic breaks out, that we can handle them more efficiently and um, at less cost uh, than the most recent coronavirus um, crisis. Uh, the subtitle of this particular um, joint policy roundtable is preparing for health shocks in the 21st century. And as I think Etienne Basso, who introduced the event, made clear, we in the European Parliamentary Research Service are now doing quite a lot of work on future shocks, as we call them. And indeed, we produced a publication just a few weeks ago, Future Shocks 2022, which will be the first, hopefully, of an annual series, which will look at pressing potential threats to the European Union and what we need to do as a system to enhance um, our resilience uh, and our uh, potential effectiveness in uh, countering them as we go forward. Um, I apologise very much for the fact that I was not able to be here at the very beginning. I had, unfortunately, to take uh, another meeting at high speed, but I think the, uh, the event was very effectively introduced, as I understand it, by uh, my colleague uh, Etienne Basso. We now come to the close of this particular uh, joint uh, roundtable, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Alan Beretz, President of COST, and Marcus Shoran, who is the recently appointed head of uh, our Scientific Foresight Unit, uh, STOA, inside the Parliamentary uh, Research uh, Service. Alan Beretz is President of the COST Association and American Professor at the University of Strasbourg. Welcome. Thank you so much for sparing the time to join us. And he's had a very distinguished career, uh, notably in France. He was previously special envoy of the French Prime Minister for the European Universities Initiative of the European Commission, as well as having served as Director General for Research and Innovation at the French Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation. He's also chaired the League of European Research Universities, Leru, whom we also are privileged to count as a partner uh, for EPRS, and has been president of UCOR of the University of Strasbourg and of the Louis Pasteur University in Strasbourg and holds a PhD in farm ecology. Um, thank you so much for sparing the time and for uh, now uh, potentially uh, offering us your insights into the current crisis and its implications for the future. And he will be joined by Marcus Scheuren from the EPRS, as I say, recently appointed head of the Scientific Foresight STOA unit of the EPRS, the European Parliamentary Research Service. He previously headed the Secretariat of Parliament's uh, Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Era, AIDA. And he's also worked on the Parliament's Economic, uh, and, Mon uh, Economic and Monetary Affairs uh, Committee and several other parliamentary committees over a distinguished career in the administration. He studied Business and Economics at the University of Beirut in Germany and at EDAC in Nice in France. 
So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over uh, to Professor Perez. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, uh, and my congratulations to everybody that spoke today. It was a, a fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic symposium. Uh, I have a few minutes just to try to summarize it. I will do it in a very transversal way and uh, without reviewing every, every speech, of course. I think there were three main issues that were tackled today. One is time frame, one is the disciplinary issue, and one is the political issue. The time frame issue was really uh, stressed by Nicholas, but not only by him. The issue is to be there in advance, to be prepared in advance. And this is on the scientific field, but also on the funding field, and also on the legal and political fields. The other, and probably the one that was the most stressed today, was a disciplinary issue already uh, pointed out by a uh, member of the parliament Van, Van Premp uh, in her introduction, but everybody spoke about it, Ilaria with the ego versus echo. I like this expression uh, and the, the way she, she stressed the holistic approach. Uh, Jeremy for AMR, Andrea, etc. They, they all they all stress that this can uh, those type of issues can only be addressed through, through a complementary, multidisciplinary uh, approach. And finally, the issue, the third main issue is the political, and I would even say the geopolitical issue, uh, stressed especially in the third panel. Uh, it's very important. Some aspects were maybe left out that it's not all countries are equal, for example, or also a, a subject I didn't hear about, which I think is very important, is the issue of scientific advice to politicians, uh, scientific brokerage, as it's sometimes said. And clearly, that's something that should fit also in the general picture. Um, the other point uh, that was so that the, 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 all those three approaches stress the, the importance of a global approach. As it's often said, uh, a chain is only uh, strong as its uh, weakest link. And uh, this stresses the importance of networking, uh, of linking the various stakeholders together. And as was said by one of the speakers, but it should be a, a network for the network, it should be a network for results. Uh, and uh, this, I think, is very important. But I want to make a more general remark uh, in this very short summary, of course. Uh, a lot has been said about risk management, evaluating risks and being ready to respond to threats. Uh, but I guess it's not enough. Uh, the real issue, and it was stressed in one of the latest response, what about if it's another virus? How do you prepare for the unexpected? And even how do you prepare for the, the unthinkable, something you never thought of before? Um, I might remind uh, a very old and very well-known saying of Pasteur, fortune favors the prepared mind. So the, issues, the issue is really preparedness, preparedness of the mind, of course, but also of structures, of legislation, of political tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we need a certain preparedness toolbox, uh, which should contain the, some tools as in the toolbox, uh, and, and tools addressing the education, the research, the, the, the policies, whatever. Uh, some of those tools were uh, addressed today, maybe not all of them. Let me make a few suggestions. Uh, favor research-based education, put strong emphasis on basic research, non-oriented research, blue sky research, whatever you want to call it. Uh, defend also long-term sustainable goals and values considers all the consequence uh, of, of science, scientific, of course, but technological, societal, non-scholarly issues uh, of, of science. And finally, as Sildi stressed earlier, invest in trust. It's not just a question of science. It's not just a question of money. It's just not a question of policies. It's a question of trust. And finally, I want to say that cost, which I represent today, is really proud to be maybe just one of, very modestly, one of those tools, because we invest in networking, we invest in transdisciplinarity, we invest in science policy advice, 
and also we invest in widening, in making science a global issue for all countries, not just for, I would say, the, the richest countries. And to conclude, let me give you another citation by one of my favorite authors. Uh, the French will know it, maybe on international audience lets, it's Pierre Dac, who was a very a funny intellectual, and he said, and I quote, predictions are difficult, especially when they deal with the future. Having said that, I want to thank all the organizers at the APRS and at COS for this wonderful meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And just to say how much we've uh, enjoyed the process of partnering uh, with COST. Uh, it was your initiative to come and talk to us about the possibility of doing certain things together. And this is the first of what I hope will be a whole series of joint events and joint initiatives. And uh, we look forward very much to building on that and consolidating that going forward. Over to Marcus Shoran to round things off. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you, dear panelists. Uh, I have the unenviable task to to conclude now after this uh, broad range of uh, uh, very inspiring and very uh, thoughtful uh, presentations from our panelists and the uh, very comprehensive uh, wrap up um, um, by by. Um, um, by my co-speaker, uh, Professor Barrett. Um, it's uh, it has indeed been a very insightful two hours. Uh, I, I think my my key takeaways uh, start with already the 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 speech by our um, uh, MEP, Mrs. Van Bremt, uh, focusing on the uh, need to break the silos. In, indeed, as as Professor Barrett pointed out, uh, that we need to take a horizontal, holistic approach, which is something which is very dear to the European Parliament, and also indeed in the in the newly set up uh, special committee on on COVID, where where colleagues are looking at. Uh, several uh, uh, topics linked to COVID and what lessons can be learned. Um, uh, the, the first panel, I, I thought uh, um, uh, Dr. Capua gave uh, uh, went in the same direction. The need of looking at the uh, at circular health and health as a system, and looking at other um, topics such as food, agriculture, and transport, which uh, goes very much in the same uh, line. Um, Professor Webb, um, I thought, gave a very bleak. Uh, <laughs> Uh, look at at the challenge of anti uh, uh, antimicrobial re resistance AMR, um, uh, which was then followed by I, I thought uh, very relieving um, um, session to looking at where we stand with uh, uh, crisis preparedness at at EU and at global level with the at the uh, ECDC uh, and uh, the role of vaccines, which I, I thought was uh, relieving to hear that that uh, there is a reaction at European international level and and lessons have been learned. Um, and then uh, to conclude, Dr. Briand, and then uh, uh, um, our EPRS colleague uh, Clément Evreux, uh, looking at actions at at global level and, and indeed in the EU, what has been done. Um, uh, I, I thought it was a reminder that complex global organisations like WHO are, act under similar restraints to the EU uh, uh, when it comes to bringing together uh, a, a large network of member states. So that was very relieving to hear. Um, I learned a lot. I took a lot from this uh, 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 roundtable. So thank you all, uh, the panelists. Thank you uh, in the audience for your for your questions, and uh, uh, thank you inviting for inviting me. And I look forward to continuing the discussion. Uh, one thing, Dr. Uh, Professor Barrett pointed out the, the importance of scientific advice. Something very close to our new uh, Stuart chair, uh, Christian Ela, uh, and. Uh, uh, if you follow our activities in, in store, you will uh, certainly hear more from us in that area soon. Thank you and have a nice afternoon, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. It's been a great occasion. Thank you so much. And the next EPRS event will be next Tuesday at lunchtime. Uh, we will be having a policy roundtable on a union of rights and values. Where are we on fundamental rights in the European Union today? And we will have uh, politicians, officials, uh, practitioners, lawyers talking about this, including introductory remarks by uh, Michael O'Flaherty, who is director of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. So look forward to seeing uh, hopefully uh, many of you next uh, Tuesday lunchtime for that uh, next EPRS event. And once again, thank you to such a distinguished panel today. And thank you to all of those who followed us throughout this two hour meeting and contributed also in different ways to making this event hopefully a great success. Have a very nice afternoon. Bye-bye.